Welcome to WHBC TV. I'm Dr. Tai A. Adoboboe, the lead pastor of Wellman Heights Baptist Church. I greet you this morning with Christ's joy. It is a new day dawning, and it's time to sing the Lord's song again. I greet you, and I welcome you. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our message series on the book of James that we're calling uh, Talking the Talk, Walking the Walk. And this morning, we're going to go right into chapter two of the book of James as James is going to wrap it up this morning and he's going to be talking to us about a, a key question that we need to ask ourselves as believers and James question in chapter two of the book of James is this are you a Christian snob are you a Christian snob uh, come join me in a little while we're going to go into the sanctuary as we go into the word of God and I'm going to invite you to get a pen and paper listen this message this morning is going to be a hot one it's going to be a hot one but I trust and I believe with all my heart that you're going to be blessed as the word of God is being preached to you this morning. Take a pen and paper and come join us as we go into the sanctuary for the message this morning entitled, Are You a Christian Snob? I've titled our message this morning, Are You a Christian Snob? Are You a Christian Snob? Before you take your seat, Ask the person next to you, look at them, and politely ask them, are you a Christian snob? <laughs> I said politely ask them. I didn't tell you to rub it in. You may be seated in his holy presence. A deacon was told before end on what his role will be at an upcoming missionary banquet. And he was told to be sensitive to the fact that they were going to be guests at the banquets from foreign countries. And he was to be sensitive to their culture and do whatever he can to make them feel welcome. Well, during the banquet, the deacon found himself seated next to an African man who was hungrily devouring his food at dinner and trying to think how he could break the ice with the African man, the deacon leaned over and said, chop, chop, good, huh? And the African man gazed back at the deacon and simply replied, replied chop, chop, mmm, good. A few minutes later, the African man was glugging down his coffee. You could hear the sound, and the deacon leaned over again and whispered, glug, glug, good, huh? And the African man who was a little bit uncomfortable at this time replied, Huh, good. Few minutes later, to the deacon's dismay, when the guest speaker for the evening was introduced, it happened to be the African gentleman sitting beside him. And the man got up and delivered a stunning message in an Oxford accented English. Flawless. When he was done, he walked straight toward the deacon at their table, whose face by now had turned very red. <laughs> and the speaker leaned over and whispered, blah, 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 good, huh? <laughs> you don't want to be that deacon. Think of how embarrassing That was supposedly a true story. But as embarrassing as it must have been for that deacon, up to a few years ago, that could not have happened for a white man and a black man to be seated at the same table, even in a church. Oh, oh, am I boosting? Even today, there's still places where people still need to be set free from the spirit of racism and classism and sexism and ism. Oh, you're not talking back. There are walls 
that still needs to come down. Yes. Barriers that needs to be broken. Because as we've been singing, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Oh, don't, don't get me going. Don't get me going now. It's been well said and well documented that in some parts of the United States and even here in Canada, 11 o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. That's where whites go to their church and blacks go to their church and they both would not meet. The devil is a liar. Church, I said the devil is a liar and Jesus is still the Messiah. Some of us will have a cultural shock when we get to heaven. And find out that Jesus doesn't look anything like we think, like us. He doesn't look anything like we think he looks. <laughs> we'll be shocked. Uh, like, uh, like Archie and Jack, who for years, for years, these two friends have been arguing over whether Jesus Christ was white or black. Archie, who is white, was convinced that Jesus is white. And Jack, who is black, how can somebody be certain? It was certain as day that Jesus was black. And they argued about this all their lives. One day they were driving in the same car and still arguing. No, he's white. No, you're wrong, he's black. No, 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 Jesus, no, no, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Back and forth. The argument got so fired, so got so heated that one of them who was driving stopped paying attention, runs a red light, bam. They both died. And instantly we're standing at the pearl gates. They got there and asked Peter, St. Peter, Please tell us, we've been arguing all our lives. Tell us, is Jesus black or white? Just about that time, Jesus walked up to the man and said, Bonus Dias. <laughs> Church, in our text this morning, James is going to be saying, You can't be a snob and say you are a Christian all at the same time. Have you ever been to, in a church of spiritual snobs? <laughs> they act like they're better than you. <laughs> ah, you, you are there and they don't even notice you're there. Ah, okay. Maybe I should ask you, do you know who a snob is? Give it to me. Somebody said a snob is a person whose nose is always turned up. <laughs> his nose are always turned up and his eyes are always looking down on you. I see, I, I can be a snob. That's a snob. <laughs> Obviously, James, the writer of this New Testament passage we just read, was talking to a church filled with a bunch of snobbish Christians. So far, he's been teaching us that we would know our faith is genuine when we're taking the licking and we're still taking. And last Sunday, he cracked, he cranked up the engine by saying, we will know we're for real by how we do the word we hear preached Sunday by Sunday. Because how many know talk is cheap? James has been teaching us. He's been saying, 
what use is it if you're only just talking the talk and not walking the walk? Because if we talk the talk, we better be ready to do the walk too. Not only are people watching us, but God is watching too. Today, everybody say today. He's going to rev it up. He's <laughs> going to rev it up. Last week he cranked up the engine. This week he's going to rev it up by saying, you can't say you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are a Christian snob. You are a Christian snob all at the same time. That's an oxymoron. Look, look at the story he gives. Look at the illustration he gives in verse 2. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, picture this. So here comes in Mr. Goldfinger. I didn't make that name up. I checked it out. The word with a gold ring here literally means in Greek, gold fingered man. Hence, I call him Mr. Gold Fingers. He would have had a gold ring in all and every fingers, a nugget at every knuckle. See, back then, it was a status symbol for a rich man to wear gold rings on every finger. Today, we'll think a person like that is a pimp. We'll say he's pimping, he's pimping, he's pimping. But not so back then. Back then, to have rings all in your thing is a status symbol. Even the big Rolex watch in his wrist ain't fake. I mean, this guy is all decked up in an Amani suit, fresh cuffs, much like Pastor Ty. <laughs> what, 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 what? The guy is all bling bling. I can see everyone's eyes shifting on this guy as he walked in. You, you know how somebody walks in in the middle of the service and everybody is like, <laughs> and never mind that I'm, I'm here preaching out my heart. <laughs> uh, everybody's like, I'm going, oh, I'm still here. It, people are whispering, people are whispering. Who is he? <laughs> who, who is he? Obviously, because this man commands attention. He's not just a run of the mill kind of a guy. This guy, oh. But James says, another man comes in. In a dirty clothes. This is a poor, probably a homeless man in shabby clothes. Qu quite frankly, no one paid attention to him, except that he stinks. And, and he looked like a hobo. Then the ushers get in on the act. Verse 3. A snotty usher. Not, not our well-known ushers. <laughs> I'm just saying, just imagine if this happened here at Wilma, okay? Then the usher says to Mr. Goldfinger, you sit here beside Dr. Tai in the front where everybody can see you. But it's not the usher 
says to the hobo, to the guy who doesn't look the look and who doesn't sp smell like Hugo Boss, <laughs> you go sit at the corner there beside Auntie Eileen <laughs> where no one can see you. Back then, let, let, me, let me take you. Can I take you through a history lesson here? Yes, yes. Back then, the synagogue, uh, Mary and I, when we went to Jerusalem, we, we saw synagogue, we went to synagogue. Back then, the synagogue churches had only a few benches to sit on. Most are empty. There were only few chief seats. You remember in the gospel? Jesus said there's chief seats that only the Pharisees and Sadducees love to sit in. Yes. Only few chief seats. Everybody else had to either stand or sit on the floor with their legs crossed. Some who are well-to-do will bring their own footstool from home with them. See what he's saying here? Or come sit beside my footstool. Some would come with their footstool but even worse would be to ask somebody to come and sit down by your footstool, by your feet. Oh, that's decent. That's dishonoring you all. If, you, if it was 100 years ago, there will be a sign out as you enter this church saying, Negro, colored people over here. James says, wrong, wrong, wrong. Be careful how you judge. That's what partiality or favoritism means here. It means to receive by face. To judge by looks. Be careful how you judge. You can't judge a book by its covers. Don't you know yet that all that glitters are not gold? Amen. If you want to be a snob, go ahead and be a snob out there. Knock yourself out. But snobbery in the church of Jesus Christ has no place. Hello, somebody. So for the remainder of our time, let me share with you from this text three reasons why you can't say you are Christian, but you're acting like a racist. You know, she doesn't look like, like us. Or he speaks with an accent. Why you can't say you're a Christian, but you're, like, you're acting like a sexist? Oh, she's a woman. We're the boys. Or, or, or you're, liking, you're acting like a classist. They live uh, in, in government housing. We live in the burbs. James says, and you call yourself a Christian? Three reasons why you can't be a snob and a Christian all at the same time. Who here is ready to receive this morning? Amen. Oh, it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot in here. It's going to be hot in here. It's going to be hot in here. I'm warning you. Tell your neighbor, ready or not, Pastor James is going to give it to you. Reason number one. James says, being a Christian snob is wrong because... It is senseless. Senseless. It doesn't make sense. Look at why in verse 1. It says, My beloved brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Why? Because your God is not like that. Our God is no respecter of a person, Acts chapter 10 verse 34 says. 
our God is an equal opportunity God. Who did Jesus hang out with? People, the Pharisees, won't be caught with their pants down around. You remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Don't you? You know who she is. She was from the wrong race, a Samaritan. She was a desperate housewife of New Jersey. She had five husbands, and the one she was shacking up with wasn't even her husband. Then to top it all off, she was a woman. Well, you all know how women were treated back in those days. Nothing has changed. But praise God, the Bible says, Jesus is the friend of... Because the Father is not a snob. And if there's a place in the world, says James, where discrimination should not even be named, it is in the church of Jesus Christ. Because at the foot of the cross, I say at the foot of the cross, the ground has been leveled. Put the lifeline up. At the foot of the cross, the ground is leveled. The whole world. I was reading this yesterday in Toronto Star. Uh, about racial disparity in Brampton. And you know what's going on in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, as the grand jury. The grand jury is about to give their verdict. All eyes are focused all over the world. All eyes are focused on Ferguson. Ferguson, Missouri right now. The whole world is they're looking for answers on how to close up this racial disparity and this discrimination and cultural clashes that is killing our world. And if they can't find the answer here in the church of Jesus Christ, we are in trouble. The last time we counted... We have over 20 nationalities worshiping here at Wilma. They ask, Dr. T, what are you doing over there in that, in that church that people are coming from every nation and tongue? I say people are coming to Wilma because Jesus Christ is Lord here. Take a look around you. Take a church. Come on. Take a look around you. Take a look around you. If I dare tell everybody to start speaking their foreign language, your mother tongue, you all think we were in the book of Acts, chapter one, all speaking in tongues. I, I, I say, people are coming because Jesus Christ is Lord here. No political legislation can bring people together like this. No financial stimulus can make me love you the way I love you and make you love me the way you love me. Only the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hey. We are a multicultural church to be sure. <coughs> but our Jesus Ain't no white Jesus. I came to tell somebody here this morning, our Jesus ain't no black Jesus. Our Jesus ain't no Spanish Jesus. Or a rich folk Jesus. Or a poor folk Jesus. Our Jesus is Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, somebody. Can I get a witness from all the redeemed of the Lord this morning? If you need Jesus, you are welcome in this place. I welcome you with the joy of the Lord. You don't care what the color of your male man is. 
if you need a meal, do you? Oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want meal from a black man. I don't want, want meal from a, a, a brown man. Just, if you need a meal, you need a meal. And if your soul is lost here this morning, you don't care what color Jesus is. What you need is salvation. And what I need to tell you is, his blood is crimson red. Hey, hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. I see chains have been broken in this place this morning. Can I teach this thing this morning? While I'm teaching the word, yokes have been destroyed this morning. While I'm teaching the word, Satan is running this morning. <laughs> Satan is taking cover this morning. Somebody's mind is being renewed here today. Yeah. I, I, somebody's mind is being, re- I, I can feel it in my spirit. Somebody's been transformed from the inside out this morning. Yes. Everybody, holla, Jesus is, Lord. Jesus is Lord. See, see, Paul says, no one will say Jesus is Lord is accursed. John chapter, first Corinthians chapter 12. You can't say Jesus is Lord. And be a snob. From this day forward, you don't have to be a racist or a bigot anymore because that's how your mama raised you. No, no, no. You've been born again because God has put a new heart in you that can make you love everybody. I don't care what they look like cross eyed, bow legged, okay, like, oh, go tooth. If they name the name of our Lord and glorious Jesus Christ, Jesus says, we got one father. You are my brother and my sister. Maybe 30 plus years ago, maybe 30 plus years ago, I, I, I would walk past you in the street and I wouldn't even think you existed. And maybe you wouldn't even recognize me too. But now, we're hugging each other. Because Jesus is the best thing <laughs> that's ever <laughs> happened <laughs> to us. <laughs> Can I get a witness in this place? Yeah. Hey! He, he took our old life. He took our old life and gave us a new life. He took us from darkness and brought us into sunlight. <laughs> when I was nothing, <laughs> he made me into something. Yeah. Oh, somebody better come get me out of here this morning. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful that God did not judge you the way people judge people when you came to him? Before he let you in? Oh, I'm grateful that the father does not love by sight, but he loves in spite. Oh, that's a good. I'm glad God did not love me by sight, but he loves me in spite. Mm. Who is this message encouraging this morning? So, for Pastor James, for Pastor James, it was totally inconceivable that these Christians could be acting snobbishly toward the people that come through their doors. For the simple reason that it doesn't make sense when it comes to how the Lord of glory as himself treated them with open arms. He said in verse 1, you cannot have this faith in our glorious Lord Jesus with an attitude of snob. Are you following what I'm saying? Mahatma Gandhi wrote in his autobiography you can go read it that during his days as a student he had the gospel thoroughly studied and he was seriously considering a conversion into Christianity He believed that the teaching of Jesus was so powerful that it could be the answer to eradicate the caste system that is dividing the people of India. 
So one day he dressed up to go to church. When he went in, a snotty usher stopped him at the door and told him, you need to go worship with your own kind. Gandhi left that church that day and wrote in his memoirs, if Christianity has a caste system too, I might as well stay a Hindu. You know the influence Mahatma Gandhi had and still have. You know what it, could, it would have been like if that snotty usher that day would have said, Welcome to the house of the Lord. We have the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. We'd like to share him with you. Do you know how many millions of souls you could have won for the Lord? Hey! But someone here, someone turned up their nose and looked down on him. James says it's senseless. But here's the second reason. You can't be a snob and call yourself a Christian all at the same time. Number two, it's sinful. It's a sin. Don't look at me like that. I, I didn't say it. I didn't call you evil. Pastor James did. I, I want you to be hot in this place. Look at verse four instead. Look at, don't look at me, look at verse four. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Says he's ev you're evil. Uh, verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted. Oh, good Lord, this guy is just using words. Are convicted by law as transgressors. He's not even just saying snobbery is sinful, but he's saying it's a crime too. Ooh, good Lord, this pastor don't mince words. Okay, uh, 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 part of me say maybe I should be like Pastor James. No, but uh, this is this, this is not me. Are you serious? This guy is just giving. He's in your face, Pastor. Now, now, what was the sin? What was the sin? Is this sin sitting the rich man in front with Dr. Tai and the poor man at the back with Sister Eileen? Is that the sin? It can't be. It, it can't be because there's nothing inherently wrong with sitting in front just as much as there's nothing inherently wrong sitting at the back. That's not the issue James is addressing here. Uh, I know you all love to sit. You all love to sit in the back in this church. <laughs> no matter how many times our nice ushers, not, not snotty ushers, <laughs> nice ushers here, ask you to sit up at the front uh, so our cameras won't show empty pews. Uh, uh, you're still fighting them. <laughs> oh, they tell me what you do. They tell me what you say too. You're still fighting them. <laughs> You're still backseat Baptist. <laughs> Amen. I get our deacons and their wives to sit up in front here uh, as leaders because leaders lead. And, and as my, they support me. So, so they don't sit up here in front because somehow uh, we have a preferential treatment. Believe you me. Some of them fought me to sit up here. They'd rather be like you at the back. It don't bother me. It don't bother me at all. If you want to sit up here in front next week, in fact, I double dog dare you <laughs> to come up and sit in the first four rows that there's no room in here. Come and sit. Without the usher begging you. 
Oh, 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 oh. I lost some friends right now. <laughs> or is James indicting the rich man because he's rich? No. It's deeper than that too. It bothers me when I listen to some church folks attacking rich people because they are rich as if God is anti-prosperity. It bothers me. Don't hate now. Don't you know your daddy is rich too? <laughs> the, the Bible says, if you hate that rich man, you're hating your daddy too. The Bible says, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Yeah. Psalm 24, yeah. the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. The Bible is filled with rich men and rich women. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Abraham was rich. Isaac was rich. The queen of Sheba was rich. Joseph of Arimathea was rich. Lydia in the book of Acts, oh, she was rich too. You're rich. Oh. Somebody's looking around and going, who, who, me? He's talking to me? Has he seen my bank account? No, 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 no. You, 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 you are rich and think. Compared to the majority of the people in the world, you are rich. And that's just not Scotia Bank. <laughs> but that's not even my point. That's not even my point. What I'm saying is, be careful that you're not just as guilty about being prejudiced against a rich person as you could against a poor person because either way it's still a sin oh this is good teaching oh oh I, I just prayed some red I just prayed some red on some cockroaches in here it's equally wrong to say God wants everybody rich God doesn't want everybody rich because not everybody's going to be rich. As a matter of fact, there's a unique blessing that comes with being poor. You trust God more. Yes. Oh, don't let me get in your case now. Don't, don't let me get in your case now. You remember when you were poor and you come to church and now you, you're living in the burbs and you have your car. Oh, I'm, I'm going to just shine my car this morning. Oh, forget about church. So read your Bible correctly. In all thy getting, get understanding. The sin James is condemning here is not the riches of the rich man. Because you can be just as poor as a church mouse and still have a stinking attitude. Oh, you're not talking to me. Only my mom. He isn't condemning the rich man because he's wearing a money suit like Dr. Ty. Nor is he commending the poor man because he's poor. Why? Because at the foot of the cross, there's room for both of them. Watch this. Watch this. What James was condemning here is how everybody else in the church were acting. How the rest of the church were relating to this man who has nothing to give. Snobbing him. That's the sin. And, and church, this should, be, this should be a reminder to us at Wilma that we must never be indicted 
give me the life point. We must never be indicted with mixing a person's self-worth with a person's net worth. We must never in this church, by God's grace, as long as I'm in this pastor of this church, mix people's person's self-worth with their net worth. Oh, you can be this because you're this. The devil is a liar. If you want to be this, you've got to show us you have the spiritual gods and the commitment and the dedication and the faithfulness to be this. Not because of the money you bring into this church. Amen? Amen? Amen. Why? Because in the sight of God in a New Testament church, everybody is somebody when Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. Oh, this is good teaching. Amen. Which leads me to Pastor James' third reason why snobbery is wrong. Quickly. Number three reason. You're going to like this one. Put it up. It's stupid. <laughs> say, say it with me, stupid. stupid. James says in verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? See, I told you we're rich. I told you it was rich in faith. Did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And hears of his kingdom, verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man because he can't put anything in your offering plate. But this is where James says they got it all wrong. These church folk, they got it all wrong. This is where he says it. Sometimes we think the rich folk in the church are the big givers. <laughs> Gosh, I, I wish they were the big givers. You'll be shocked. Not that I know anything anybody gives because it's between you and God. But you know how I can tell. I look at my bulletin every Sunday. Because if we have some millionaires and thousand years in this church, it's not showing yet by our offerings on Sundays. We tend, to, we tend to think the rich people bring the money in and the poor people come to get our money. <laughs> Wrong! Maybe you missed something. Maybe you missed something that Jesus spent time, painstake time to show us at the treasury. When he stood at the treasury, the Bible said he sat down there and everybody, the Pharisees were coming. Oh yeah, they make noise. Boom, 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 ring the bell. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba. They were blowing the trumpet. I'm going to drop a big one. And they have this, uh, this thing here where you put, they drop the money, you, the thing shake. And they were given and given. And Jesus said, a widow, a poor widow walked up. I picture this, uh, Mama, well, my picture this. You know how those old women in, back in Nigeria, where they, they will keep their money in their rapper? In their tie, their rapper, they will tie the money in their rapper. They don't carry wallet. They don't have purse. They don't have much to carry purse. Only those of you who have money, you carry it in purse. They put the money in their wrap. And they take it out and they wrap, unwrap it. And, and you could see this woman, this poor widow. Jesus said, just going quietly and putting a widow's might. And Jesus said, here's the verdict. All these Pharisees you see, they gave out of their abundance. And it's good, give out of your abundance. But this woman gave out of her lack. I need. Amen. We have this notion the rich people give, are the big givers. But James says, keep reading, keep reading. <laughs> keep reading, this is good, keep reading. <laughs> keep reading, this is good. I told you it's, it's going to be hot, but it's also good. He said, is it not the rich who oppress you? <laughs> is it not the rich who oppress you and drag you to court? And, and call you all sorts of names, Lord have mercy. 
Now, understand again, my brothers and my sisters, is not saying treat the rich bad because they are rich. Because that's discrimination the other way. Hello, somebody. But he's saying snubbing the poor who are the very ones God has chosen to be at the top of the hill. Someday is a stupid thing to do. Because God is making them to be heirs of his kingdom. Hallelujah. Verse 5. You don't want to turn up your nose and look down at somebody that God is blessing. Hey, 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 hello, somebody. And somebody here, I stop by to tell you, it's time you stop being a Christian snob. And it's time you, you start finding out where God is walking and get on his side quickly. Give me the lifeline. And if God is on the side of those who come into this church, whether they're poor or rich, black or purple, English speaking or ESL, then it will be stupid of us not to welcome them here. Amen. Am I preaching the Bible truth here this morning? Amen. Can I tell you the, the kind of church I long to pastor? I long to pastor a church where everybody is somebody. Hmm. Where a doctor and a lawyer and an accountant are welcome. And then, sitting beside them are the homeless, uh, uh, the factory worker, uh, and the illiterate. Because they are welcome too in the house. I I'm talking about a church where people come in and they just look around and say, Oh, this place is heaven. The, the, this is what heaven is going to be looking like. People from every culture, every tongue, and tribes all gathering. Behold how they love one another. And praise God, Wellman has become a place like that. Amen. Isn't that what attracted you to this church? Come on now, come on now. You, you, isn't that what attracted you to this church? Or maybe you're faking it. A, a place you can come to where everybody knows your name. Amen. And they're always glad you came. Oh, oh, I, I feel like cheers this morning. A place where everybody is somebody because Jesus is Lord. I got to close. I got to close. I, I got to close the same way they, uh, Pastor James closed. He closes by giving us a powerful solution to snobbery. In verses 8 to 13. This Wednesday, I would expound more on that. If you come to prayer meeting, I will expand more on that. But let me quickly suffice to say, here it says the solution is, let love be our common language. Let love be our common language. Verse 8. Verse 8. Look at verse 8, eight with me. If however you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as your... James said, you're doing well. You all know what the royal law is, don't you? It's the law of love. So, so it don't matter whether you're from Bangladesh or Timbuktu or Congo or you were born here in this freezing country. It don't even matter whether you're a man or a woman, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. There's one language we, we all can understand and speak to each other. And that language is love. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad. Everybody say abroad. Abroad means everywhere. Abroad 
of our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So we can no longer blame our snobbery or racism or classism or sexism and all these isms on the way mama raised us anymore. We can't say that's just the way it is anymore. Because now we are a new creature. We're born again by the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says if any man or woman be in Christ Jesus, he or she is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold new things. Oh, I'm almost done. High five the person next to you. High five them and say, I'm not going back. Oh, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Because I cannot be a snob. I cannot be a snob and be a Christian all at the same time. The walk. The walk. I said the walk. Has to match the talk. I said the walk has to match the talk. Hello, somebody. Let me close. Let me close. I got to close. I got to land this. I got to land this. There was a woman who lived on the wrong side of the tracks. And she wanted to join this affluent church in an upscale neighborhood. She walked to the pastor. She, she met the pastor at the end of the service and, and talked to the pastor about joining the church. And he was rather embarrassed. He was rather embarrassed about this woman's social status. So he told her to go home and think about our request for a week. At the end of the week, the woman came back and the pastor said, now let, let's not rush into things, let's not rush into things. Go home and read your Bible for an hour every day this week. And come back and tell me if you still feel like you should join this church. Although she wasn't happy at the attitude of the pastor, but she did what she was told to do. She went. Well, the next week she was back assuring the pastor that she wanted to become a member. In exasperation, the pastor didn't know what to say. He said, he said I have one more suggestion. Go home and pray every day this week and ask the Lord if he wants you to be a member of our church. Well, the pastor didn't see this woman for six months. <laughs> and one day, he bumped into her downtown. And he asked her if she's been praying. And the woman said, yes, of course. As a matter of fact, I've been praying. Then what, what did the Lord say? What did the Lord say to you about joining this church? Without hesitation, the woman looked at the pastor in the eyes and said, well, one day, as a matter of fact, as I was praying, the Lord said to me, don't worry about getting into that church. I've been trying to get into that church myself for the last 20 years. <laughs> hey! Come on now. May that never be said of Wilma Heights Baptist Church. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because isn't that true? Isn't it true? Yeah. That people don't care how much we know. People don't care how much we know. They don't care how fancy our sanctuary or our building looks like until they know how much we care. Yeah. Welcome back. I trust the message was a blessing to you this morning. Uh, it was a very hot topic. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, segregation and we talk about uh, racism and sexism and classism uh, that is so pervasive in our culture this, this day. And uh, if you've been following the news this, uh, this week alone, uh, in Ferguson, Ferguson is gearing up uh, in Missouri. They're gearing up for the, uh, the, the grand jury verdict. And, and the world is watching and the world is waiting. And I believe with all my heart that God will get the glory in the end. And, and if there's any place, if there's any place where God needs to be honored, you would all agree with me that 
God's name needs to be lifted up in the church. That in Christ's church, there is no barriers. There's no black, there's no white, there's no Jew, there's no Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So you heard this morning uh, that James said it's, 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 it's wrong, it's totally wrong to be a snob. Uh, to be a snob is, is, is senseless. To be a Christian and call yourself a snob, it's sinful. And above all, uh, as James said this morning, uh, it is stupid. Uh, by God's grace and God's will, uh, we will continue to be the church and you, be con you continue to be the Christian that God is calling you to be. Let's continue to walk the walk as we talk the talk. Let me pray with you this morning as you continue to serve the Lord together, as you continue to grow in your faith with Him and in growing in loving people. Join me as we pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for that person who is watching us this morning that you will continue uh, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is. As you said in your word, there's liberty. Continue to help them to live in, in freedom, to live in the liberty that you've come to set them free. You've come to set the captives free. And today we rejoice in your freedom as a country, as a nation, as a people, as believers that we have in you. And now God, help us to be uh, that caring church, help us to be that caring Christians uh, that you're calling us to be, that we would not be a snob as the world is watching us. And above all, you're watching us. So, Father, we bless you, we worship you, and we honor you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm hope, I hope that you received the word this morning. I know that it's been a heavy one, but by God's grace, uh, you can go and walk in newness of life. Because the Bible said, He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Give your life to Jesus this morning. Uh, it's transforming you. It can transform you. It can change you. And it can cause all the crooked way straight in your life, in Jesus' mighty name. Join us next week at the same time. God bless you and love you, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs>